We're looking today in the book of Revelation, and we are looking in chapter number three where Jesus speaks to the church at Philadelphia. We're in a series of messages on the seven churches that Jesus addressed in the book of Revelation. We have looked at Ephesus, the church that lost its first love. We have looked at Smyrna, church that was suffering, that was persecuted. We have looked at Pergamos that Jesus described as trying to minister and sit in uh, hell's headquarters. We've looked at Fire Tower, a church that was too nice to be narrow. Uh, the teaching of Pergamos had filtered into Fire Tower and now it had become doctrine. And then last week we looked at the church at Sardis that Jesus described as being dead. This morning we're looking at this church in Philadelphia. So I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 beginning in verse number 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them the synagogue of Satan, which say are they are Jews and are not. But do I, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved you, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take it. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you today that, Lord, you know each person that is listening to this message. Father, you have walked with them through these last several weeks, a period of change to everyone's lives. Father, we've not been able to meet and come together. and Lord, we really desire fellowship with one another. So, Father, I want to pray, Lord, for each one, that, Lord, you would speak to them. Father, you would encourage them, that, Father, you would help them to walk strong during this time. Father, I look so forward to coming back to this house of God and worshiping with your people. Father, I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. This morning I want us to look at a church with an open door. This was a church that God truly honored. Philadelphia is a church that Jesus had nothing negative to say about. Someone said that the church at Philadelphia was like a rose between two thorns. There was the church at Sardis that was dead. And there was the church at Laodicea that was self-sufficient. But here was a church that God blessed, that God honored, that God said, I'm going to keep you through that trial because you have been faithful unto me. Now the scripture says that Jesus knows the works. He knows everything about this church. And so he comes to them 
with this message of encouragement to them. He says to them, first of all, I am the one who is holy. I am the one who is set apart. The scripture says that Jesus is holy. That he is holy God. Listen to the words from Isaiah chapter 6. Beginning in verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried one to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah said that God is a holy God. This word means to be set apart. It is the word that means that is translated hagios, which means to be set apart for a particular reason. Because God is holy, he is set apart. He is different from other people. The writer of Hebrews said this about him. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 says this. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. We have a holy God. But not only do we have a holy God, we have a true God. Jesus said, I am not only holy, but I am true. True as opposed to false. You know, you can be truthful and still not be true. I heard about a man who lived next door to a habitual liar. And one day he got tired of this man always lying to him. So he said to them, you know, tell me one thing and promise me that you are telling me the truth. And the man looked at him and he said, what I'm about to tell you is the absolute truth. And this is it. I never tell the truth. He was truthful, but he wasn't true. Jesus is always true. He is the one who always tells the truth. He will tell us the truth about salvation. He will tell us the truth about sin. He will tell us the truth about heaven. And he will tell us the truth about hell. He always tells the truth. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. Jesus is always true. But the scripture says there's a third thing that Jesus says about himself. And that's this, that he is the one who has the key of David. He opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. If we go back to the Old Testament, you would find the words in Isaiah chapter number 22. And in Isaiah 22, verse 22, the scripture speaks about a man named Elijah. Actually, it begins in verse number 20. And it says this, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Elijah, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. And this is the focal verse. And the king of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall sh shut and none shall open. What was he saying? He was telling them 
that here was a man that God had set apart, and this man held the keys. Now the keys were to the treasury. The keys were to the, the, the thing that held the truth. And so Jesus says to us, I hold the keys. Isn't it interesting that Jesus has everything? You know, I've heard some people say that, you know, the church just can't afford, and then they'll say this. Well, that's not true. God has never failed because of the lack of finances. People fail because of their lack of faith. God is always faithful. I heard about a young man who had died and his wife was with his young daughter. And she began to cry and she was very upset and she began to say, well, I don't know how we're going to make it. How in the world will we, we ever get through this time? And the little girl looked up at her and said this, Mom, is God dead? While we were walking through these times, we need to understand that God is still here. That God has not left us. That He is still on the throne. God is not dead. He's alive. Now, notice several things very quickly about this passage. This, this church with an open door. First of all, notice the opportunities that God gave to this church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things say, he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opened it, and no man shut it, and no man opened it. What has God done? God has opened a door for this church. This church was faithful unto God. And God opens doors to every church that is faithful. We have got opportunities today. Well, what are the opportunities that God gave to this church? Well, first of all, he gave them a door of grace. In Acts 14, 27, he said this, that God had opened a door to the Gentiles. Thank God for that because you and I are Gentiles. And thank God that he opened a door to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Jesus said, I am the door. He is the one who opens that door. He opens the opportunity to grace. The scripture says, by grace are you saved through faith. That on yourselves it is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. But not only has he opened the door of grace, but he's also opened the door of the gospel. And Matthew, the Great Commission, teaches us to go throughout the whole world and share the gospel. You know, if you could look back in the history of this church, you would find uh, several individuals that God has Paul from this fellowship. I think about Jack and Kathy Thomas. I think about Geraldine and Maxine Reeves. That God called from this fellowship and that God used to carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about the opportunities that God gives to us when we, we give to the uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering, to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. I think about the times when we've gone on mission trips. I think about the times when our, our children are, are taken out into the community and they are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we have got opportunities. There is a door of the gospel that is open. And beloved, even right now, there is a door open for you and I. 
I want to invite you to share with others what God is doing in your heart and in your life because God opens those things. Now notice not only the opportunities, but notice also the observations that Jesus makes about this church. He says to them in verse number 8 that thou hast a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. He said to them, you've got a little strength. And some of us right now would say, well, you know, that describes me exactly right now. Because I don't feel like I've got much strength. I don't feel very strong in the Lord. Let me say to you, if that's how you feel, that's a great place to be. Let me tell you why. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was dealing with a thorn in the flesh. We're not told what it is, and thank God we weren't, because we would say, well, there was Paul, and he had this problem, and it really doesn't apply to me. But we're not told his problem. What we're told is that Paul pursued this, and he prayed about it, and that's what we should do during this time. We should pray and seek the face of God, ask God to, to turn back this, uh, this violence that has taken place all over the world, pray for the healing of the nations, but pray that in the midst of this that God will work in hearts and lives of people. But here's what he said. He said, I've asked God three times to take this thing away. But Jesus said to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, whatever you're going through, I'm enough. And I want you to know this morning that whatever you're going through, God is enough. God is enough. Now, notice what he says here. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be made perfect in weakness? It means to go through the trial. It means that as you are going through that trial, that you are trusting, you are depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to compare this church, when I'm saying of this church, I'm talking about the church in Philadelphia, with the church at Laodicea, Laodicea thought they had everything. They didn't think they needed anything from God. Because they said, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. The problem with that church is that they were strong. They thought, but they weren't. Here Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia, you are feeble. You don't have much strength. Just be patient. I read about Theodore Roosevelt who had a dog. And this dog was always getting into fights. He always picked a fight with a dog that was much bigger than him. And usually he was on the short end of the stick. He got whipped most of the time. Well, he tells the story about getting in this fight with this big old mangy dog. And, and this dog just whipped him. I mean, he, he was just in bad shape. And so what someone said to Mr. Roosevelt, he said, you know, that dog of yours is not much of a fighter. And the president turned to him and he said, listen, he's a great fighter. He's just a poor judge of dogs. Here was a church that kept the faith. They were small. They were 
evidently that they were tenacious. Not only were they feeble, but he also says, hey, in the midst of this, you're also firm. He said, you have kept my word. You have been faithful to me. You have honored me. You've kept my word. You have not denied my word. You have been faithful through all these things. And Jesus commended them for that. Not only have you kept my word, he said, you've not denied my name. They were faithful to the end. In the midst of everything that was going on, they were faithful. I read about a man from North Carolina who had been injured and he was near the point of death. And so his mom told his dad, said, I want you to go and I want you to be with our son. He's not going to live, but I want you to take some cookies to him and I want you to be with him to the evening. And the farmer said, well, Mom, I, I've got fields to, to take care of. I've got things to do. She said, no, I want you to go. I want you to go, and I want you to promise me that you will stay by our son. So he makes the trip many miles to where the, the son was at, and he was there, and the son recognized him, and he ate just a few bites of the, the cookies that had been uh, fixed by his mom. And at this point, the people in the hospital said, you've got to go. And he said, I'm not going to go. I've made a promise to my wife, and I'm not going. Well, a few hours later, he passed away, and the farmer made the trip home and he began to talk with his wife about all the details of what had happened to their son. And she said this to him, did you stay with my son till the end? And he said, yes. She said, that's all that matters. I don't really care about anything else. You were faithful to the end. That's exactly what the church at Philadelphia was. They were faithful to the end. Now we've looked at their opportunities. We've looked at their observ Jesus' observations. I want to look very quickly at the opposition that uh, was there at Philadelphia. He says in verse number 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to, to uh, come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved you. There was opposition, and it came from the Jews. You would think that these Jews from which the Messiah came, would not only know, but serve and love the Lord Jesus Christ. But they were. They were opposed to this church. And Jesus said that these people were of the synagogue of Satan. And he said, I want you to know, because you've been faithful, I'm going to bring these ones who have persecuted you, who have opposed you, and you, they will come and they will bow at your feet. Aren't you glad the scripture says that one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. What a Savior we have. Verse 11 says this, Behold, I come quickly, hold thou fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh, verse 12, now, 
very quickly, we've looked at the opportunities, observations, opposition, but look very quickly at the overcomers. He that overcomes, he that is a victor, who that stays faithful to me, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, first of all, I'm going to make a pillar in the temple of my God. There in Philadelphia, they had a tradition. If someone had done something very great, they would take a pillar and they would put it in one of those temples with that person's name on it. So that forever and forever, when someone came by and saw that pillar, they would see that person's name and what they had done. Jesus said this, I'm going to make a pillar in the temple of God. I'm going to write your name on something that is eternal, not something that can be destroyed as that church finally was. But he said, I'm going to make you a pillar. And you will go no more out. It speaks of the fact that Jesus is our security. We don't have to worry about anything because of who we are. He also said this in verse number 10. He said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. Jesus said, there's a time coming when all the world is going to go through a trial and a test. If we're looking right now, perhaps we might say that's exactly what's going on right now. Now, I don't believe that this is what's going on right now is what Jesus describes later on in Revelation. But I do believe this, that Matthew speaks about earthquakes and wars and pestilence that are the beginning of the end. And I wonder if God is not trying to prepare the world for his coming. And he's saying to us, people get ready. It's time. Notice what he said. Because you love me, I will keep you from this hour of trial and temptation. What does that mean? It means the same thing that Jesus spoke about with Noah. When the flood came, when judgment came, what did God do? God took his people out and he put them in the ark. The same thing was true at Sodom and Gomorrah. Before God destroyed them, God took his people out. The scripture says that's exactly what Jesus is going to do. Jesus said also in verse number 12, he said, I'm going to write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem that cometh down from heaven from God, and I will write upon him a new name. In Revelation chapter 21, the scripture speaks of this new Jerusalem that's coming down, where God has prepared a city for his people. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and there will I be. I encourage you. Are you ready? If Jesus were to come today, are you ready to meet him? Beloved, God loves you. God had given his church an open door. Perhaps God is giving 
the churches in America and throughout the world one more chance to open the door where people will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture is all about. I thank God for you. I want you to know that we are praying for you. I want you to know that God loves you. Whatever you're going through, He's still here. And He's still on the throne. And I want you to know how much I miss fellowship with you. And I've had so many people say, oh, I cannot wait to get back to the house of God. I'm looking so forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. And have a wonderful day.